Well, this is just lovely. I'm, I'm happy to welcome the two of you. A little talk with Maggie on the break. And uh, came to a, a nice understanding that I'm not really out to assassinate any of these people. Far from it. They have to be here. Um, it all has to be here. So I have no agenda right now or, or nothing to get on a soapbox about. So if there are questions, I'll be glad to answer them or comments or anything. But I haven't prepared any material, so here I am. If anybody is watching the live stream and would like to submit a question, maybe Michael could read it and transmit it. You can do that? Mm -hmm. Sure. OK. OK, I have a question slash comment okay. regarding the difference or um, anything between complete mindfulness mm -hmm. um, and enlightenment and being awake. OK. Um, mindfulness is an intentional practice. It's, a, it's an instruction that you're given and you try to fulfill that instruction. And the idea of mindfulness is to allow whatever arises to arise without getting caught up in it to the extent possible. And often there'll be a technique um, offered to help you to do that. Um, the two I know that seem to work for a lot of people is one of them is to watch your breath or even count your breaths. You just either feel the breath coming in your nostrils and out again, that's one way, or you f feel it in the gut, you feel the, the breathing action here. So that's one. So the mindful, mindfulness practice in that sense would be count your breaths or watch your breathing and allow whatever thoughts and feelings and sensations and emotions to arise without being attached to them. That would be mindfulness practice, yeah? So um, some people believe that if one practices mindfulness, eventually you will become enlightened. But I don't really know what that word means, so I don't use it myself. It seems to mean different things to different people. And um, it's become so um, overused that it's kind of lost meaning. I started to use the word awake because that's kind of what it feels like when you notice that you're not doing anything. It's like waking up from a dream where you were the doer and everything that you decided was crucial and important and had consequences. And then you realize that you're not making those decisions. The decisions are made before you know that they needed to be made. Um, one example I give is if, if I offer you ice cream and I say you can have vanilla or chocolate, you choose. And then and, and everyone else is watching this transaction and you say, well, vanilla. And they'll all say, Amy chose vanilla. She made a decision. She decided to have vanilla. And what I say is, on what basis did you make that choice? You chose the one that you like better, right? Well, when did you choose to like vanilla better than chocolate? When did that happen? Our likes and dislikes are j just arise. We're stuck with them. I, I, I like to sleep with a woman, not with a man. I never chose that. When I was growing up, it was just obvious. I never chose to be heterosexual. I just am. And so if someone says, Robert, your sexuality is a choice, you're, you're performing that. You're performing being a man. Uh, I, would, I couldn't relate to it. I, I think most of us would agree to that, that we just are the way we are on, on, 
in our sexuality. And so the same is true with um, our emotional life. Some people are just born with buoyant spirits and other people are born morose and depressed. It's just the way it is. And no one ever chose to have the personality that he or she has. You're stuck with it. It comes upon you like fate. Part of it is encoded in the DNA and the rest of it is formed by the experiences you have which are never chosen either. Those experiences arise um, due to chance or fortune. You're born with a certain body and its capacities. You're born into a certain family, in a certain neighborhood, in a certain country, in a certain historical epoch. And all of that, plus chance meetings, you, you're in school, you don't, never chose your classmates, but those are the kids you grow up with. And all of this comes together to produce a, a uh, sense of self. And none of that's chosen. So then to suddenly say, okay, I get that, I didn't choose any of this, but now I'm going to choose to do such and such, it's a strange way to look at it. You, you, what you choose is what you have evolved to, to choose. And there's no getting around it. So then people will then say, well, but if I hear something is good for me. Let's say I hear that chocolate ice cream is better than vanilla for my health, which it may be because chocolate has some apparently health, healthy uh, substances in it. Well, then you hear that and then you decide that you're, even though you prefer vanilla, you're going to learn to like chocolate because it's good for you. Yes, that can be done, but When did you choose to be the kind of person who would listen to health advice? A lot of people don't. They would hear the same health advice and say, I don't care because one day I'll die. I may as well just enjoy whatever I enjoy. I'm going to eat whatever I feel like eating and not even think about it. And that's my way of doing it. I'm going to be hedonistic and, and just enjoy what I, what I eat. That's not a choice. Some people are moved by health advice, some people aren't. Some people understand what I'm saying and others don't. You can't decide to understand. You cannot decide to understand anything. You either understand or you don't. Someone says something, you get it or you don't get it. You can't say, I really want to get that, I'm going to keep trying. And It doesn't work that way. You can't try to understand. You understand, or you don't understand. So what I'm saying is there's no chooser, there's no doer. That's not what myself is. What myself is is a noticer. And when that is noticed, when the noticer is noticed, I am saying, that's what I call awake. Now I'm I'm speaking, but I'm not making the words. The words are issuing forth. I, I said that earlier. And so, just like you, I'm hearing those words for the first time. It's no different. We're all noticing these words if we're attending to them. And I'm just hearing them and noticing them. And I'm, I have feelings that arise just like we all do when certain words are spoken. And I don't make those feelings. So if these words that I'm speaking now are amusing to me, great. But I can't make them be amusing because I'm not making the words. Maybe, uh, let's say I'm not speaking, I'm just thinking. but. You see that we have a problem with language because when we say, I am thinking, it separates the I from the thinking. But there's really no difference between the thinker and the thought or the thinking. There are, that's, one, that's one motion 
we just split it into three parts because of language, subject and object. But truly, um, when thinking is happening, that's when there is a thinker. Without thoughts, there is no thinker. Without thinking, there are no thoughts. So without thinking, there's no thinker. So no one is thinking as a doer of thinking. Thinking just happens. So if we understand that, here I am sitting here thinking, let's say, and my thoughts are very disturbing. They make me feel terrible. Gee, maybe so-and-so, whatever. And I start to feel terrible. Can I decide not to feel terrible? Can I decide not to think those thoughts? No, it's too late. The thought, the, the thought came up. There was no way to stop it before it came up because you weren't aware of it. So it's just there. And once it's there, the feelings involved with that kind of thought are also there. Now, what are you going to do with that? Well, there, there is a practice. It's a rather esoteric practice, but it is a practice. What do you do with that? What, what I do with it is I open myself entirely to every moment with no resistance and without, without focusing on myself and what I want and don't want. It's a practice. I just open myself up to any, mo any moment and just allow it to be what it is without attempting to change it into something I like better and without trying to get what I want out of it, but just notice the suchness of the moment. And I find that in that practice, there is a meaning. It's not a meaning that can be put into words necessarily, but there's a meaning to this existence. And so now I'm not just breathing and walking around in a funk. I'm feeling this aliveness that we all are. That's what I call awake. Do I call it enlightened? No, because I, I don't I, I don't I don't want to use that word because it means such grandiose things to so many people. It's like there's only some people say there's only 12 enlightened people at any one historical time. I mean, there's people who really believe that kind of crap. So if they do, I don't want to trigger them by using the word. And if then if I said, well, you see, you ask me about how, how I handle this or what it, what it is. I don't remember your original question, Amy, but if I, if I say, well, this is my practice, just be wide open. Let it all occur and just deal with it. And I say, that's enlightenment. Someone will say, no, no, Robert, that's not enlightenment. The, the great masters were enlightened. You're just this guy that's got a little shtick. And they, they could be right. So I would never use the word enlightenment. Maybe these great enlightened beings, like the mythical Buddha or whatever, were different from me. But I don't really think so. I doubt it. I think that the Buddha and I, if we could actually meet in real life, probably be on the same page, more or less. But I, you know, as I say, if that sounds grandiose to someone, I'm willing to back off on it. It's nothing I have to believe in to be here. It's just an observation. Self-observation. Yes. Does that do it? Thank you so much for the question. It's a good one. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I would like to ask you, because I think I've read on your webpage as a psychotherapist that you recommend a frugal and active lifestyle. Yes. Is that something you would still like say as, as you speaking now? Yeah, when I, I wrote that many years ago, and the idea was that if someone's feeling depressed, because that was, that was uh, an article about depression, I think, where I first said that, but then I put it just in general terms. One, one good way to deal with depression, I have found, is to eat less and exercise more. 
seems to be beneficial, not just for the body, but for the mind also. We don't want to feel bogged down and too heavy, and, and um, it's also good to move. One of the difficulties I've had the last few months is that I was flat on my back and couldn't even um, walk, and uh, my body really felt it. I'm beginning to get some muscles back, which feels wonderful. My usual practice before the injury was to walk a few miles a day with my camera around this town. Or I know I've walked all the roads of Todos Santos, every street and every every dirt road, that, so far as I know. And um, I'd like to get back to at least 50% uh, of that. So there's always hope. So there, there are also there are other dietary changes that can be helpful for mood, um, and you can read up on that online. So the idea being there, be, the idea there being that what we ingest, drugs, alcohol, tobacco, food, all of this influences not just the body, but also the, the mood. And, and um, I think it's wise to take that into account. That's what that, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. yes? Thanks. Sure. I also have another question. Okay. Uh, it's about the title of your new book is uh, Depending on Nothing. Yes. And uh, I was wondering what you think about, this is from Hui Neng. So as far as I can see, the, the practice was to basically dedicate your life, shave your head and be part of the monastery and also like be explicit about uh, Satori or awakening. And then even the, the master would also determine whether whether you have walked the gateless gate or not. Yes. So I was wondering what do you think about this, about this practice? Well, I find myself awake and I've not practiced those things. So apparently for me, it wasn't necessary. But if it's necessary for someone, go, up, go for it. I mean, part of what I have to share is not to imitate the way I am, but to find out what you need to do and whatever that is, and it might be something very extreme, I would say go, go ahead and do it. it. Might be something very extreme. I, I've gone to some extremes when I was younger and learned a great deal from them. I didn't shave my head and sit staring at a wall for uh, 10 hours a day, not that kind of extreme, but other kinds of extremes. Risky behaviors that certain people would never consider doing and stuff like that. And um, probably contributed to awakening, although I can't be sure of that. But so the, one, of the, one of the most important things about my work is I'm encouraging people to follow, to, to you mentioned Alan Watts earlier. Alan Watts used to say this a lot, be a lamp unto yourself. Not look at, to, to Alan to enlighten you, but look, look to Alan to be someone who's encouraging you. There's all this material out here, and um, now you do something with it. And, and that's, what, that's exactly what I'm saying. I have no answers to esoteric questions. I don't know what happens when you die. I don't know what the self is or isn't. But I, I do know that it's wise to pay attention to your own heart, very wise, and let it teach you because it's speaking all the time. We really all know this. We all know this. It's in our language. We say that something is heartfelt. It means you're touched by it. You, oh, it got me. See, I felt that. And that's what 
I say we need to do as, as a spiritual practice, if we need a spiritual practice, is to feel your own being, your own experience, and let it, let it talk to you, let it tell you. It does talk. It's the, it, the language is not usually verbal. So it can be, though. But in fact, I've heard voices in my own. And see, an hour ago, I was saying, oh, no, I don't believe in this non-material thing. So I'm not saying that these voices come from some other realm. I, please don't imagine that I'm saying that. But it's almost as if someone is telling me, Robert, and then there'll be some little message there. If, if, you, if you have that experience, hold up your hand. No, no, almost everyone. Yeah. So you two don't. That's OK. San Diego, San Diego's a tough town. It's, it's too noisy there. You can't really hear these voices. <laughs> no. Do, do, you, do you not sometimes just get a little message that seems to come from your own mind? It never seems any different than any of the other okay. thoughts. Well, you are, you're a solid materialist. <laughs> I don't, yeah. Catania says also yes, and she says, hi, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Catania, we're meeting at uh, La Morena at 6.30, and uh, it would be great to see you there. She's watching the live stream. That's nice. She's gonna kiss me. Okay, so no women kiss kiss me now. I don't want. <laughs> <laughs> like we were before. Every, well, everyone was dying to. You're just holding yourself back. I know. <laughs> That's ridiculous. <laughs> Just a little thing. It's not a question, but I think one of the most helpful things about one of the most helpful things yes. is that there's no you never encourage dependence. And as you say, it's things we already know. It's to trust yourself, mm -hmm. what you already know. Yes. But when you look outside of yourself, then you hear another message mm -hmm. and then you doubt what, as you say, you already know. Yes. That there is no special place to get to. There is no way that your own self is gonna be improved, better, bigger version. Yes, I agree with you. This is, this is it. Yeah. And the next moment will be it also, but it won't be the same. Exactly. Nothing's ever the same. And if you can't sort of focus in on that reality, then you are missing your whole life, and it's precious. It's, it's passing so quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so don't, what I hear you saying is don't let outside authorities talk you out of your own mind. Yeah, yeah. I think that's really great advice, because they're just human like you. They yeah. may have a PhD and a, um, a following and have published 30 books, but that doesn't mean they know anything about you and Absolutely. what you need to do. Absolutely, exactly. Well, that's, that's just the key to the whole thing. Once you know that, you're on your own. You're on your own, but in, in an incredibly liberating way. Yes. Because the, I think there's nothing that will encourage you to not trust yourself more than running to other people to tell you what to think and and feel yeah i think that's what carol was saying that th there's a conflict that that she was expressing between not wanting to be lonely but also not wanting to be caught up in this outside force is that's pretty much how i understood what you were saying did i get it right yeah, well, that's pretty difficult because it's hard to, um, what I call free fall is not um, always pleasant. No. Um, and if you actually don't listen to the outside information as a source of reality, you really have nothing to grasp. You're just here 
and um, each moment is baffling in a sense. It, it just arises and before you can make anything out of it, it's gone and we're on to the next moment. This is what um, Shoghian Trungpa um, said that um, it's like falling out of an airplane. The bad news is you don't have a parachute. But the good news is there's no ground. Now, that really comes close to my experience, I must say. Very close. When I read that, I was just so delighted. I heard that and I said, yeah, that's, that's what I'm talking about. I have no parachute. I'm just falling. And the world is going by as if you are moving through it in a sense. It's all here and you're moving through it. And um, yet, although it's a fall, I know I don't need to a parachute because there's no end to it. There's no ground. We're not going to suddenly... Now, I, I happen to imagine that when the brain dies, the lights go out, and then there is no more falling. And that, frankly, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> right? Yeah. It's not, if, you, if, that, if we really knew that to be the case, I think we would all feel a lot better about death. I think one of the things that troubles people is, what if that's not true? And what if you end up in some horrible bardot with voices coming at you that you can't understand. I, I was asked that question, pre precisely that question. Yeah, you say that, Robert, but what if? And do you know what I said? I said, in that case, I'll have to do the same thing that I have to do now, deal with it. Now, that actually fills me with confidence because I'm, I'm dealing with it. So I'm, uh, by the time that other thing happens, if it were to happen, I don't think it will, but if it were to happen, I've already got pretty good at it. And so um, there was this um, Pascal's Wager. Do you all know what the Pascal's Wager is? Pascal was some Middle Ages religious figure, and he said, I'm going to, if, if we have to, I'm going to believe in God. If there is no God, I'm no the worse off. And if there is, he'll welcome me into heaven because I believe in him. So he said, this is a, a no-lose situation. That's, a, that's Pascal's wager. And um, I say that's a really bad idea because what if there is a God, but it's not the God you thought it was? <laughs> And it's, 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 it's it, right. And also, you'd want to be with the fun people anyway, so. Uh, yeah, there's this great Woody Allen movie. I don't know if you've ever seen this. It's called, uh, uh, what is it called? It's called, can't come up with the title. The opening scene is brilliant. Probably some of you have seen this. He's on a train. Yeah, and there's all these depressed people bad-looking, depressed people on this train, and he's one of them. He's looking around, and he, he sees that he's with his, his, his kindred spirits. They're all bummed out, and they're on this train. And then he looks out the window, and on the next track is a train, and it's filled with beautiful people, and they're drinking champagne and kissing the windows, and the, the women have, <laughs> have decolletage and all this kind of thing. And he... he he tries to pull the emergency brake, and <laughs> he wants to get on the other train, but, but he, he can't. So his train pulls out, and so does the other one. And you can just see he's just crushed by being on the wrong train. But there's a punchline to this. So his train arrives, and they're in this 
They're in this vast um, garbage dump. There's all kinds of trash scattered around and piles of, of garbage. And they walk from the train into this scene of, of detritus. And um, then the other train pulls in, and the, the people and all their finery get off, and they're in the same, they're in the, they're in the same dump. Well, that's, that's brilliant. <laughs> I think that's our real situation. You, you can be spiritual or hedonistic or whatever it is and think you're getting away with murder, but we're all going to the same place, I say. It's what, it's what happens before you get to that place that's where all the action is. And I also want to say something else about loneliness. I, I think you're really honest in saying that you feel lonely because a lot of people won't admit it, but we all feel it. It's the human condition. We're all lonely. We have to be, even if we have a good friend or a loved one with us, because there are things about oneself that can't be explained to another person no matter how willing that person is to try to tune in the station, and no, and no matter how good you are at expressing it, there still be things that one feels that cannot be communicated. And you just have to sit with that. Yeah. So the thing I like about this group of people here, this group of friends, is we pretty much all know that and accept it, and just try to enjoy this week that we have where all these people who feel similar, not the same, but feel a similar focus, we get to be in the same place and have dinner together and have a few laughs or dance or whatever we do, and then um, everyone will go home and I'll be on my own again. I could still come and sit in this chair, but it won't be the, <laughs> won't be the same. <laughs> Far from it. So I celebrate all of you, and I'm grateful for your presence here. And those of you who have traveled a long distance to be here, how beautiful. I'm so glad you did. And I will try to return the favor. Awesome.